Happy Halloween. I'm in a basement. How does that keep happening? Last week, we were introduced to the phylum platyhelminthus, the flatworms, and got to know the non-parasitic flatworms of class Turbillaria. This week, I'm honored to present to you the other three classes, in order from most chill to least, class Monogenia, the fish parasites, class Cestoda, the tapeworms, and class Trematoda, the flukes. Monogenia are unique from the other two parasite classes in that they only require one host for their entire life cycle. That host is usually a fish, but some species also infect amphibians and aquatic reptiles, and one species lives exclusively on the eyes of hippopotamuses. So if you see a wild hippo, remember to get as close as possible so you can check its eyes for parasites. Monogenia are also different from other flatworms in that they are ectoparasites, meaning that they attach themselves to the outside of the host body rather than inside the organs. They're not ashamed to show themselves, unlike those cowardly tapeworms. Let's move on to tapeworms, shall we? And might I recommend sitting down with a nice, rare, undercooked steak while you watch? Tapeworms live with a unique challenge, the complete lack of a digestive system. No gut, no stomach, not even a mouth. Instead of eating their own food, they spend their adult lives inside the intestines of other animals, passively absorbing nutrients from food that's already been digested by their host. During their life cycle, tapeworms need at least two separate hosts. Let's use beef tapeworms as an example, since they're the most common to infect humans. The life cycle starts when a cow ingests plants contaminated with tapeworm eggs. The eggs hatch in the cow's digestive system, and the emerging larvae penetrate the intestinal wall and migrate to the muscle tissue via the bloodstream. Once the larva finds a nice cozy spot, it develops into the juvenile stage and patiently waits for its host to be eaten. When the cow's meat is ingested by a human, the juvenile attaches itself to the small intestine and develops into an adult. It increases in length by growing rectangular segments called proglottids. A beef tapeworm can produce up to 2,000 proglottids, each one possessing a complete set of both male and female reproductive organs. The proglottid can self-fertilize, producing between 50,000 and 80,000 eggs before breaking off from the rest of the worm and exiting via the back door. If the proglottid is lucky, it ends up getting dumped near a patch of vegetation. If it's very lucky, the proglottid, along with its thousands of eggs, are consumed by a grazing cow, starting the cycle over again. I try to avoid speaking negatively about any animal, but I'm confident in saying that tapeworms are kind of a bummer. So thankfully, only about a thousand people in the US are infected with them every year. Globally, that number is closer to 50 million due to poor agricultural regulations and sewage disposal practices. But for those of us with the privilege of living in a wealthy nation, avoiding a tapeworm is as easy as making sure your meat is sourced responsibly and cooked appropriately. I'm looking at you, Liver King. Just imagine how many worms live inside that silly guy. Okay, this next part is going to be a bit challenging. I like to maintain an atmosphere of positivity and appreciation in these videos, but researching the parasitic flukes of class Trematoda made tapeworms look like beanie babies. Flukes, much like tapeworms, have a life cycle dependent on at least two hosts. What sets them apart from other flatworms is that they have two sexes, while almost all other members of the phylum are hermaphroditic. There are 24,000 known species in class Trematoda, each with their own variation on life cycle and host preference. But for my own sanity as well as yours, I'm just going to highlight one genus. One terrible garbage nightmare of a genus known as blood flukes. It starts with eggs contaminating fresh water. The eggs hatch into larvae called mericidia, which swim around until they find a snail to burrow into. Once within the snail, the parasite reproduces asexually, multiplying many times before transforming into another free-swimming larva called a cursaria and exiting the snail. This is where you come in. The tiny cursaria splash around in the water until they encounter a human. They super sneakily burrow into their new host's skin and enter the bloodstream, riding it like a lazy river and developing into their adult form before taking up residence in the blood supply of their host's liver, intestines, and bladder. From there, they find a mate, fall deeply in love, 
and produce thousands of eggs that travel through the bloodstream to be released as waste, ideally into a body of fresh water. The worms themselves don't cause much serious damage, aside from itching and some sensitivity around the area of skin where they entered your system. The trouble occurs when your body reacts to the eggs. This results in a condition known as schistomiasis, and schistomiasis is not a fan. Fluke eggs can create scar tissue and swelling in the intestines, bladder, kidneys, liver, and lungs. In some cases, the eggs get lost on their way out and end up in the central nervous system, resulting in lesions and scar tissues forming in the brain and spinal cord, and occasionally even causing carcinoma, a type of cancer. Blood flukes exist primarily in sub-Saharan Africa, South America, the Caribbean, and Southeast Asia. Infection is preventable through access to filtered water, and treatable with access to medication. Unfortunately, schistomiasis is still one of the most devastating parasitic diseases on Earth, responsible for over 200 million infections and roughly 200,000 deaths every year. I'm not sponsored by any organization, but I'll leave some links in the description for anyone interested in learning more about providing access to clean water, sanitation, and medical care in developing countries. Next week, we're going to meet some microscopic freshwater buggies that won't burrow into your bloodstream. Doesn't that sound lovely? Some of the most important nutrient recyclers in freshwater ecosystems, with excellent mustaches no less. The rotifers, phylum rotifera. Until then, stay curious, stay connected, and never stop evolving.